Well, good afternoon from Ithaca, New York. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nicholas Phillips, and I'll be serving as your host and moderator today. Open up any restaurant menu, and oftentimes you'll find a suggested wine to pair with a particular dish. What if you prefer a crisp lager over a fruity Riesling? Well, certain beers pair just as well with food as wine does. So Hefeweizen, for example, goes really nicely with a nice slice of haddock, while an IPA is a great complement for some spicy food. Restaurants all over the country are incorporating beer into their menus, and with the holidays quickly approaching, people who may be hosting are also thinking about their own menus and what to serve family and friends. Is it okay to braise a turkey in a pilsner? Which dark ale should you add to a beef carbonade? We'll also help you understand what to look for when reading a beer label and some of the different terminology. Understanding the different flavors and complexities can also help turn a holiday meal into an unforgettable experience. But we also want to hear from you, our audience, and we want our conversation to be as interactive as possible. So please submit your questions. We'll be fielding them throughout and getting as many answered as we can. But first, we do want to learn a little bit about you, our audience. So scan the QR code with your phone. Now, the first question I want to uh, gauge you all on is, what's your favorite type of beer? So you can, again, just submit your uh, responses right in that QR code there. Now, as we wait for your responses, let me introduce you to our awesome panel. Joining me in studio is Doug Miller, a lecturer in the Nolan School of Hotel Administration. He's also authored our Beer Essential Certificate. Also joining us from the Tar Heel State is Ari Sanders, the Director of Tavern Operations at Full Steam Brewery, who also decided to come back and do another keynote with us. And lastly, joining us from California, where I'm sure it is nicer there than it is in upstate New York, is Chef Michael Wiley who is also a professor in the Culinary Institute of America. So it looks like we're starting to get a couple responses in. I'm seeing Irish Stout, Lager, Double IPA, IPA. So we're starting to get some uh, responses in. So I really want to kind of set the stage here. So we have three outstanding panels with different backgrounds. So my first question is actually twofold. One, what's your favorite beer and what makes it your favorite beer? So for me, for example, my favorite beer is a pumpkin head beer from uh, Portland, Maine. It just... I don't know, it kind of feels like home. Doug, what about you? What's your favorite beer? Uh, I'm easy, all the above. Because uh, to me, it, you know, I love going to different tap rooms and breweries and seeing what they're doing and their hard work and talking to the brewer. So it, it changes by location and experience. And Ari, how about you? What's your favorite kind of beer and what makes your favorite? Um, my favorite beer is the beer I have when I'm sitting down with my friends. Um, I've always thought about beer as an experiential shared thing. And so if I'm with my buddies and we're having a laugh, whatever's in that glass is going to do me just fine. And how about you, Chef Michael? Uh, for me, the, my favorite beer or the best beer is that first one after work. But uh, that's usually for me, it's a uh, hazy IPA. I'm a, I, I, I'm a big fan of some of those, but uh, I do enjoy all styles of beers and they all have different uh, applications. Mm -hmm. It seems like the audience is right in there with you with some IPAs. Um, so I really want to kind of base on our conversation here. So what are some basic rules of the road when we think about pairing food with beer? And uh, let me start off with you, Chef Michael. Um, for me, when I'm trying to pair food and beer, what I usually look for is things like the flavor impact of the beer. Um, that can range anywhere from delicate to intense, you know, when you're going from lager and ales to things like uh, something that might be a little bit more fruity or robust. Uh, things like uh, uh, sours or um, IPAs. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at that. I'm looking at the body of the, uh, the, the beer and what the food type of food I'm pairing it with. So some things can be, um, you know, light and citrusy and fizzy and other things can kind of be, have malt characteristics and be dark and caramely and stuff like that. So I'm um, usually trying to find harmonies within the flavors and looking to pair the different flavors. Um, that's one of the reasons why I like those IPAs is because of uh, the wide variety of hops that are used in them. They all have a, a, a number of different flavor characteristics that they bring to the product. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm really looking at when I'm uh, uh, pairing beers. But you also uh, might want to look for contrasts as well, right? So if you have something uh, in a beer that uh, might be, uh, sh uh, or if you have something in your food that might be fatty, you might want to cut that that's going to be uh, with something that's going to be somewhat acidic or, or light or fizzy in the beer. So uh, harmonies and contrasts, I think, are two of the most important things to take into consideration. And I have a great follow-up question. Uh, for you, Chef Michael, but I want to get to Doug first. Um, Doug, when looking at a restaurant's menu, what are some key words to remember when we're thinking about selecting a beer for our meal? 
Well, I think part of it, the, the build upon the chef is saying is look for how the food's being prepared. Um, is it fried? So potentially more fat content. Is it grilled? Uh, so does it have a smoky element to it in case of a steak? Uh, so looking at a menu, one of the things I'll look at is keen on, on how something's prepared and build it off mostly off the protein. The sauce can come into play if there is a sauce, mm -hmm. but I would key off of your pairing off of how it's being prepared and the protein uh, or the main component of that dish. One thing to consider is that we all perceive things differently. So what I think is a great pairing, somebody else might not enjoy and vice versa because uh, we're all unique to our own selves. So don't always get caught up on I must do X with Y. Make sure you explore and see what works for you. And with different flavor profiles, um, I want to ask you, Chef Michael, this question. Uh, is there a hard, fast rule when it comes to pairing beer with food like with wine? So, for example, I'm thinking of most of us think about pairing a white wine with chicken, for example. Um, does that relate to beer as well, or is there something that uh, we can all think of when we think about pairing a specific beer with a specific uh, dish? Um, I, you know, for me, I think Doug could probably speak to this really well, um, as well as Ari, but um, for hard, fast rules, I know that typically when you have like a high alcohol, that's gonna usually um, kind of intensify the heat in a dish. Uh, so when something's really spicy, if you have something that's higher in alcohol, that's gonna intensify the heat. But in regards to um, um, pairing with white, with white, with uh, fish or, or white meats and red, with uh, red meats, I, I kind of feel like there's a, a lot of room for for play in this industry um, with doing that. And 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 you know when you when you begin to understand some of the um, uh, flavors and tastes of different styles of beers, and you understand that complementing and contrasting, when you begin to get into that, I I, I think that uh, once you kind of understand how those components work, the the rules are are, are there. Um, you know they're there to be broken and to to really kind of play with those things and see how they, they work together. And Ari, I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well. Um, for me, I've always thought about it as, you know, what does meat eat? Meat eats grain. What's beer made of? Grain. So I think beer is always a very natural um, complement to food. And I do think it's very important to just have some intentionality. When you decide to set that pairing up, what are you trying to show off? Do you want to break the palate up to like reset for the next dish are you trying to show off the light buttery complexity of a sauce are you trying to show off the richness of a red meat so what are you trying to accentuate when you make your pairing is really important to it intentionality there is important but play you know rules i won't say to say rules are meant to be broken rules help us along the way to learning but what I like about mm -hmm. sitting down, you know, the whole reason why I enjoy seeing a beer paired menu as well as a wine paired menu is to make it something for everyone at the table. So that's kind of why I agree about play with it. Mm -hmm. And as a quick follow up for you, Ari, I want to ask, um, what have you seen as far as beer's popularity goes with the rise in kind of some more craft breweries? Well, I think as people have you know experiment with their palace a little more beer no more no longer is that you know six pack of macro in the back of your dad's beer fridge it's now when i go out to a nice dinner it's as socially acceptable to order a beer you know in the past in certain circles you ordered a beer people would kind of look at you like oh this uncultured swan but now you see <laughs> but now you see like craft beer becoming very mainstream and people are thinking of beer as having this very wide swath of flavors where in the past it was adjunct lager or a stout was pretty much what people talked about. But now we're seeing IPAs, we're seeing sours get mainstream, we're seeing people experiment more and recognize that beer can offer the same range of complexities that wine can. And uh, what's your most popular beer down there? I'd love to know. Oh, most popular right now, our Paycheck Pilsner. It's a metal winner. It is truly delightful. Corn Pilsner sits around 4.5% alcohol. You know, the Crispy Boys are in, in vogue now, so that's becoming our top seller. In the past, it was Rocket Science IPA, which I firmly believe is the Triangle's best IPA. But those are the two people really go wild for. But, you know, the true Full Steam fans are always waiting for Southern Basil to come out. It's a Basil Farmhouse Ale, and it is 
you know, that's one of the ones I take a case of home for myself. <laughs> I'm starting to get thirsty now with all these beers. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. So I uh, kind of want to loop Doug and uh, Chef Michael in here as well. And uh, my question is, are there any significant differences between pairing uh, beer versus wine? And then I'm um, specifically thinking about um, when it comes to students. So how do you kind of teach your students when it comes to pairing? We'll start with Doug and transition over to you, Chef Mike. So one of the things to consider is like we don't taste differently. We don't say mm -hmm. I'm eating X food and then my body tastes differently when I'm enjoying something else. So physically, our bodies function the same um, and, and our palate and what we taste, part of that comes into play our previous experiences. Mm -hmm. So what have we been exposed to? What are we familiar with? What are our likes and dislikes? You know, if you don't like the dish, you're never going to like the pairing. Uh, mm -hmm. So that also comes in, comes into play. And, and that's why when I'm with my students, I, I think it's important that as I was saying, it's important to understand the rules, but then also once you understand those rules, start thinking about what works for you uh, and not always going by what somebody else said or what's listed on the top 10 this list or whatever website saying this is the greatest thing forever. Uh, start thinking about what works for you and what potential pairings work for you. And that'd be the exact same with wine. You know, mm -hmm. some people prefer red, some people uh, hate white wines or vice versa. And that's okay. It's about what enjoyment and what experience you're going to get as an individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me and my wife struggle with that. She's a big white person. I'm a big red person. It's just kind of how, how it goes. Uh, but Jeff, Michael, I'd love to hear uh, your response as well. Yeah, um, we have a restaurant that's open to the public. It's uh, the Gatehouse Restaurant. And um, we have some great instructors down there. Uh, Professor Mercer is down there right now. Uh, when I was working in the restaurant, I was working with uh, Professor Keith Rada, and he was a really um, uh, incredible sommelier in the, in the fact that he would um, really try to diversify. Um, I would challenge him quite a bit because I have a, um, I lived in Korea for seven years. So um, I do a lot of uh, different styles of uh, Asian foods and I've been um, playing a lot with fermentations lately and I do, um, you know, fermented kimchi and potatoes, ferment potatoes and things like that. And those are some um, tough things to usually pair because you have all that kind of sour and lactic acid going on. But at the same time, he was very creative with a lot of the stuff that he did. So he diversify the menus and some things would be with wine, white or red. Some things would be with beers and some things would be with uh, sake or different um, other types of distilled spirits that you would have in there. Um, to kind of play around and, and make it a really diverse menu. In regards to um, uh, training palates and, and, and the way we taste, um, I always found it interesting, um, you know, when we think about uh, our, our culture here in the United States, you know, we're taught white with white and red with, with red meats and typically uh, spicy foods, we usually go with sweet things like Rieslings and stuff like that. Um, however, when you do go to um, Asia, a lot of Asian cultures, um, and, and, and we're not, there's a lot of research that's being done on this on whether or not, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, Chinese people will eat spicy food that they typically have and they'll pair that with red wines, uh, uh, bold tannic red wines. And so um, I do think culturally that we do have different preferences, you know, so uh, mm -hmm. Professor Miller was talking about how we have different taste preferences and things like that. And it really comes down to what you like. Um, we do have different taste preferences in regards to the things that we like. So even though we as Americans might not be used to having things like tannic red wines with spicy foods and don't think those things go together, other cultures might might find that as a, as a, a pleasing uh, palate sensation or taste sensation that they're they're working with. So you know, um, I do think that a lot of it comes from our, our our cultural background and what we're used to tasting. We do have similar biologies. There are you know super tasters who are going to be more acute to tasting different foods, and they'll pick up on bitterness that might be more offensive to their palates and things like that. Um, you do have non tasters or blind tasters who don't pick that stuff up as much. Um, typically, women are more Typical uh, super tasters and men, um, and then um, you know there's certain foods that we have like cilantro, for instance. Um, I think it's like one in 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 uh, uh, ten people or something like that have this really uh, soapy. They get the soap flavor or soap taste that they get when they taste cilantro, and it really turns them off. So a lot of people don't 
like that flavor with their food. Um, and that might be something similar with beer, with certain tastes that are in beer. Um, you know, so, um, you know, the, the, there's those things to take into consideration when we're talking about palates and, and individuality, uh, cultural tasting and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. And Ari, you touched on this a little bit, and I want to kind of get uh, Chef Michael and Doug your response on this. Um, with beer now becoming more prominent, um, have you seen a change in maybe your students' taste buds, whereas before the major focus was on wine pairings, whereas now beer is you know kind of becoming a um, larger deal? Have you seen um, a change in your students at all when it comes to pairings or their taste buds, rather? Maybe Doug, you can sure. Take. So I would say yes. So I started teaching a beer course 14 years ago at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, mm-hmm. and I would have the students try a sour beer, and they mm-hmm. were ready to throw it back at me. <laughs> they just thought there was something wrong with me, and I'm talking about world class uh, sours like Cantillon and Three Fontaine. Um, mm-hmm. Now. My students uh, love it. My students, and, and part of one of the reasons why some of might be the case is we're looking at the generation that grew up eating Sour Patch candy and sour mm-hmm. items, so they were more accustomed to having sourness in their diet, in the U.S. diet. So now I have seen a shift where students are uh, into sour beers, and I've seen a shift also now they're shifting away from IPAs. Uh, when, so when I taught the class last spring, they were kind of like indifferent about IPAs, but when it came to lager and Pilsner style beers, they were all in. Um, so I'm curious to see when I teach it this spring mm-hmm. is if this indifference on IPA continues um, and they mm-hmm. move on, and do we have another transitional shift on how we perceive or what's popular amongst uh, students? Because most of my students are, are 20 to 22. Just to let you know, in New York State, if it's accredited course, it could be 18 to taste. So not all my students are 21. Uh, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how that carries on down the line as they mature and become uh, larger consumers. And uh, Chef Michael, I'd love to uh, hear your thoughts as well. Uh, I would say we have uh, less data on that being in California because our students do have to be 21 years old to taste. So that that uh, is a little bit more of a challenge for us. Um, it's definitely challenging with students that we have who are under 21 and they have to go based on the, um, you, you know, they have to go based on on what they're getting out of aromas and things like that and, and tasting notes from other students in regards to what it is that they're tasting. Um, Doug does point out, you know, I, I think it's interesting how beer just like like wine or anything else has uh, this this aspect of, of certain varietals being in vogue, right? You know, um, when the movie Sideways came out and they were talking about Merlots and, and Pinot Noirs and things like that, it's it's similar with beer where you have, uh, you know, sours coming into vogue or the, the hazy IPAs were in vogue for a while. And now is it Pilsner Lager that's, that's coming up uh, as being something that's new and exciting? Mm-hmm. And I just actually got a great audience question in, and I want to uh, make sure I get everybody's thoughts. So Tiffany actually just asked, um, IPAs are bitter to me, but are there some foods to pair with it to make it more uh, palpable? Maybe, uh, Ari, I'll start with you for your suggestion. Well, you know, this was, this was like a very, very interesting question for a lot of reasons. One, IPA is probably the broadest category of beer available in America right now. You know, you'll see an IPA that's like sitting at 135 IBUs, which is how we measure bitterness. And then you'll see one that reads sweet and juicy and almost like lemonade. So what I would encourage for Tiffany is think about what type of flavors do you enjoy? Do you enjoy lemon? Do you enjoy resin? Sounds like probably not for the resin, right? So think about like what can a fruity, juicy, hazy IPA go well with? And I would think, you know, I kind of pair those about the way I would pair white wine usually or those food and Rieslings with mm. fish, things with light buttery sauces is kind of how I would see that pairing. But, you know, every IPA is going to go great with like a nice piece of fried chicken. <laughs> Um, but IPA is so wide. I would encourage you, Tiffany, to continue to try IPA and think about what you do and what you don't like. You know, we had over almost 800 entries for IPA for Great American Beer Festival this year. So that swap mm-hmm. is so wide that maybe start narrowing down your IPA. 
And how about you, Chef Michael? Um, as as Ari was mentioning, you know, she was talking about like light buttery fishes and she was talking about fried chicken and things like that. I think for me, um, you know, as chefs, we say fat is flavor. So, you know, any, any item that's going to have that fat in there is going to be something that's going to be strong enough to stand up to those IPAs and the, the bold flavors and, and, and things like that. That is flavor. That's yeah. one thing I'll definitely take away. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Doug. The one thing I was going to say uh, is also make sure that your IPAs are fresh, right? Because mm-hmm. IPAs do change. So those lovely, juicy, citrusy notes, uh, after about 60 days, start uh, changing to be more bitter. Uh, so IP- so IPAs, I do say they have a shelf life, so to speak. It's not mm-hmm. that they spoil, go bad, but the flavor profile changes. So if you're not into the resonance style IPAs, I would make sure that you try to drink your hazies fresher. So 30, 40, 50 days. Because uh, if it's, you know, and that's why I pick up the can and look at the dates if there are dates on there. Because if you're drinking an IPA that's a year old, it's just going to be bitter. It's mm-hmm. just going to straight up be bitter. Mm-hmm. And actually that brings us to a great question is um, what are some things people should look for when trying to pick out a beer that they might like um, and Doug I'll start with you so I think the, the key thing is going to a place where you know you have a knowledgeable staff mm-hmm. uh, one of the places I go to I know the people behind the counter I talk to them I'm like what's in you know what do you like and I think going to your bottle shop or depending on what state you're on a uh, beer store grocery store whatever it may be and talking to that knowledgeable person behind the counter because uh, mm-hmm. they could give you a lot of great insight about what just came in. They could mm-hmm. uh, make some suggestions on potential pairings. Tonight we're having X. What do you think would go with it? Oh, we got this great coming in from wherever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think one of the things it, you should do, and that's even if depending on your state, if you can get it from your local tap room or brewery, have a conversation with the people behind the counter. Uh, mm-hmm. They're a wealth of information and can help guide you through your beer journey. Mm-hmm. And Chef Michael, what would you suggest people kind of look for, you know, maybe a specific word or something when they're trying to figure out what beer to get i I think the first thing you need to figure out is um you need to figure out what type of what type of person you are when it comes to beer drinking um Mm -hmm. so uh i remember in some of my wine studies uh there's a book by dornberg and page called uh what to what to eat with what to drink or something along those lines and and they they highlight that there are kind of there's a scale of individuals and their individuals fall somewhere on the scale and at um, one end of the scale, you have people who are kind of um, comfort seekers and they end up trying something and they, they, they try that 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 beer or that wine. Uh, in the case of wine, it might be someone who likes buttery Chardonnays and they know that's that's their style. And then typically when they go out to a restaurant or they go uh, to a wine shop, that's what they kind of gravitate towards. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for someone who likes beers, it might be someone who uh, specifically likes lagers or something along those lines. Um, and then at the other end of that scale would be adventure seekers. And those are the people who want to try something that's different every single time. You know, when you go into a, uh, a different brewery and, and then you see all the, the beer that's on the menu, you know, maybe maybe you always get the hazy IPA. That would be a comfort seeker. That's that's their wheelhouse. But an adventure seeker might see something something that pops out to them. Um, uh, Professor Miller and I were recently at the Great American Beer Festival. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. the first beer that we saw when we get in, got in was a, uh, a dill pickle sour. And both of us were like, oh, we've <laughs> got to try this. You know, this is, you know, and so are, are you that adventure seeker that really wants to try out all of those different styles and and, and the benefit of being being someone more adventurous is you might find out something new and so discover something that you really like so you know figure where you are you are on that scale and there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a person of comfort or a creature of comfort and liking your style and know what you like there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but figure out where you are on that scale and 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 uh, work with it Hmm. Dill pickle sour. I I think I would try that. It sounds it sounds interesting for, for sure. And uh, Ari, what would you suggest? Um, you know, people look for or anything like that when trying to select a beer. Well, one thing, uh, you know, I'll go back to intentionality, right? And, ha- and mm-hmm. setting your intention. So when you say to yourself, "I don't like this beer," you know, take two more sips and find out why. Mm-hmm. Figure out the things you don't like and why you don't like them. Mm-hmm. You can also say to a bartender hey, I want to try a beer that is not like this because I know that I don't like bitter. 
hey, I like mm-hmm. IPAs, but I want to steer away from IPAs that are piney. Or mm-hmm. I really would want to try the Saison, but is it really effervescent? I don't really like when my beers are super fizzy. So isolate what you really like. I really like lemon drops. They're my favorite candy. Would your IP, hazy IPA be lemony for me? So think about what you do and don't like. You know, take a little bit more time with the things you don't like to figure mm-hmm. out what you don't like about them. Because then you can kind of put those off to the side. You know, as Doug was saying, you know what you don't like. And if you don't like the food, you're not going to like the pairing. But if you know you mm-hmm. don't like bitter, it's going to be hard to sell you on a super bitter IPA regardless. Mm-hmm. So be a, be open to isolating what you don't like and be open to saying, I really like this thing and help me find it. Mm-hmm. And again, knowledgeable staff is always a key in that choice. And I want to kind of loop in our audience here with our second poll question. Like I mentioned a little bit before, we'll be kind of fielding your questions throughout. Um, so we're going to transition over to our second uh, audience question. My question for you is, have you ever cooked with beer? And if so, what did you make? Um, and we're getting a couple responses here as of now. So we have corned beef, for example. Um, so my question to you, Doug, and for the rest of the panel, have you ever cooked with beer and what have you made? So yes, I've, I've cooked with beer. And you know, if you look at like countries like Belgium, they cook with beer on a regular basis. You go to a restaurant, the chef is adding beer to the sauce, the braising uh, with the beer. So, you know, uh, I think beer could be a great addition for obviously braising. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it also could be utilized uh, sometimes. If you have a little bit of like barbecue sauce in that bottle, add a mm-hmm. little beer in there just to shake it out to get the last little bit out and then pour mm-hmm. it into the pot. So I use that sometimes. <laughs> I take a sip in the bottle, shake it, pour it out. Uh, so I think beer could be used a lot of different ways in, in culinary applications. I can honestly say I'm not a great cook, so I've never cooked with beer, <laughs> cooked with beer before, but I'm getting some great suggestions. Uh, Ari, have you ever cooked with beer, and what have you made? <laughs> uh, I always put beer in my pot roast. Um, mm-hmm. I generally use, like, a dark beer. You know, generally not Guinness. I think the nitro kind of cooks kind of weird in it. But any local stout I can find, I love it in some pot roast. You know, a good coffee porter is a great way to start with braising off a of pork loin. You know, start with it, maybe set overnight in that coffee porter and then do a coffee rub on it. It's one of my favorite things to do. Anytime I'm making barbecue, I always, always, I use high life when I'm making barbecue. I've just, that's just how my folks did it. And with spending time in the Northeast, uh, my grandfather had a crab stand in Harlem. So I always use uh, light, a light, a 40 or something light making blue crabs. Okay. And uh, Chef Michael, what have you made with beer? Um, yeah, I, I agree with Ari on the, uh, the stewing and the braising, you know, those are fantastic, uh, culinary techniques where you do a combination of dry and moist cooking. Usually you, um, for braising, you're taking a large piece of meat and you're searing it off and getting that beautiful Maillard reaction on there. Um, and then you usually use like a, a dark stout or something like that and braise that item in that stout. You could do something similar with a, a stew where you have usually smaller pieces of meat and that can either be uh, seared off for the Maillard reaction or it could just kind of be simmered in the, in the beer. Um, along with the beer, you put some stock in there as well and that's gonna add to the savory element. Um, you know, whenever we make, uh, when we do frying, Ari and I were talking about battering uh, items and frying items and things like that, but it, beer serves a really important component um, when you're making a batter, uh, when you dredge something like fish in flour and then you put it in a wet batter, that beer helps to aerate that batter and give it the light crispiness. So the, the, the effervescence in there helps to give it the batter, that light crunch in there. So that's a fantastic way. And then of course, there's the, um, the ever famous, which is a fantastic way to cook is the uh, beer can k- chicken in which you uh, prop the chicken up on a can of beer over a uh, uh, set of coals and then the beer evaporates into the chicken and you get all that flavor and moisture into the chicken. So that's, that's another great way of cooking with beer. Um, you know, you could put it into desserts and, and, and work it into desserts as well and make different cakes and pies and stuff like that with it. So yeah, it's a very versatile product. My ears just peaked up when you mentioned desserts because I'm a big dessert guy. <laughs> well, I was gonna, I was just gonna. I think the strangest thing I did is I did fruit roll-ups. So mm. I basically prayed uh, raspberries and added a sour beer to it and dehydrated it, and did fruit roll-ups with a sour beer. Ooh, mm. I like that. That sounds really good. And it looks like uh, 
Chef Michael, you had mentioned a little bit about stew before, and it looks like a lot of our audience actually is made chili, and a lot of them have done the beer with chicken, so they're kind of thinking right along those same lines. Um, and when we're thinking about you know cooking with beer and everything like that, um, I want to know, are there any areas of concerns when we're thinking about cooking with beer? So, for example, if someone's gluten-free or not, um, is that something maybe we should take into account? And Chef uh, Michael, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I mean, when, when you have beer, you definitely have that gluten allergy that's in there. Um, I, I think Ari could speak more to the brewing styles if there is anything available without that that grain in there, but I don't think that's the case. But you, you certainly have to be wary of any kind of allergens that you would have in there. Mm -hmm. And Chef Ari, uh, are there any beer styles maybe that, um, you know, maybe don't have gluten in them or anything that uh, we might be able to cook with maybe that's more um, geared towards people who might have food allergies? So, you know, I feel like a lot of people when they eat don't think about drinking as a part of their meal, right? So again, like be mindful of gluten when you're choosing to cook with beer. Be mindful of any adjuncts. You know, some people are particularly allergic to, say, apples. You know, every once in a while you'll see apples and sours or any fruits or stone fruits, you know, in your stouts. Be aware of beer nuts. You know, just pay attention, be intentional, think about what you're doing. There's some pretty interesting research out there that certain types of lambics and those and those bacteria and those yeast from the sour beers are breaking that gluten strain apart enough to not aggravate celiac, but those papers are being peer reviewed right now, but we might find out in the future that some of these old school lambics and certain wild fermented beers might be breaking the gluten down enough to not affect the with celiac, but don't assume it's okay just yet. There's still some research being done, but that could be coming for our folk with our celiac. Mm -hmm. And I have a great follow-up question for you, Ari, and this one actually comes from uh, Christian. So they ask, what beer styles do you recommend for heavy comfort food dishes like maybe a casserole um, or stew or maybe even grits, maybe? <laughs> um, for me, I think those kind of talk a little bit about mouthfeel and also how full do you want to feel at the end of the meal? You know, casserole, those stews, this tends to be my experiences, big old bowl, be kind of full, put on a great movie around the house. So I personally would go for a dry stout for any of those meals. Mm -hmm. Good, robust flavor, but not as heavy in alcohol. Those drier beers tend to have a little less alcohol in them. That's how I would do just a dry stout for any of those. But also what makes you comfortable? You know, mm -hmm. love yourself. Say, if I want to drink this, you know, 14-year-old Bourbon County, I found the back with this because it's Tuesday, do it. But again, mm -hmm. those comfort beers, what are you looking for? You want to be like full and get something kind of alcoholic, have a little buzz with you? Or do you want to just have a few and just sit back and relax and not feel so full? Mm -hmm. And uh, Chef Michael, what's your thoughts on this? Maybe a perfect beer to pair with maybe heavy comfort food? Um, heavy comfort food, a lot of times, you know, again, you can go in a variety of directions with this. Just in general, I'm kind of thinking about the malt flavor that's going to be in those those beers or, or malt, maltiness kind of having that kind of sweetness that goes with that heavy comfort food so like uh english style brown ales or something along those lines that's 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 where i would go with that mm -hmm. and how about you I, I think comfort food is different for everybody you know one person's comfort dish is different than somebody else uh, so just like the beer itself, I, I agree with the chef, you know, I love brown ales. Brown ales are a great food beer and they're very, very versatile. Um, but maybe also uh, considering yourself, if you want something fresh and clean and light and drinkable, a good Pilsner. Um, the collection of Pilsners being currently produced by craft breweries has increased drastically in couple last couple of years. So there's a lot of great examples of that. And I think also it depends on the weather too. If you're in upstate New York, it's getting cold out there. It's, it's getting cold fast. So for me being in upstate New York in the winter, I'm thinking of something a little bit more robust, maybe a little bit higher alcohol, Versus if you're in Arizona where it's still hot or Texas where it's still hot, you know, maybe you are looking for something light, lighter like a Pilsner or a lager. Yeah, it is getting a little cold up here in central New York. So anything to keep you warm, you just you, you have to do. Uh, so actually a really interesting question for uh, Chef Michael. I kind of want to get your thoughts on this. And it 
is along that similar lines of you know cooking with beer and stuff like that. Um, what about food preparation? So how might that impact pairing? So for example, you know pairing a beer with a poached salmon versus pairing a beer with a pan seared salmon. Um, what are some things to think about when we're trying to pair some of these things? Well, so um, it, I, I think it's I, I personally think it's easier to craft the food to the beer than it is to know what, what know what dish you're doing and then find that beer to go with the food. And the reason for that is because um, you know the beer has already been made and it's been um, put in the keg or the can or the bottle. And then when you have the taste of that that beer, then you could start thinking about the notes that are in there or uh, uh, the alcohol content that's in there and things like that. And then you kind of craft your food to the way that you want that beer to be. And, and so you were talking about a poached salmon, right? And, mm -hmm. and you might have a poached salmon and, and, and maybe that would go really good with something light and fruity, like a Hefeweizen or something like that, or a mm -hmm. Pilsner or something like that. But maybe, maybe you're having to pair that sam salmon with something that's a little bit heavier. You're trying to do it with an IPA. Well, well, what are the things that I could do with that? I could take that salmon and instead of poaching it, I can uh, grill it off. And now I'm getting some charcoal and some smokiness to the salmon that I'm going to put in there. And that might help to pair that better with the beer. Or maybe I want to poach it, but instead of poaching it in a court bouillon, which would be, you know, you could use beer in your court bouillon when you're doing that. But instead of doing that, you might poach it in something like olive oil that's going to intensify the fat content in there. And that's going to allow that salmon to go with like a heavy beer beer as opposed to having something light and crisp and fruity so you know the, the 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 more the more tools that you have in your toolkit when you understand different cooking styles and what the outcome is going to be the more opportunities you're going to have to kind of pair that product or customize that product to the beer that you're pairing it with so you know you can make changes on that dish easily with a piece of salmon and I do have a great question, but I want to make sure I get to this audience question first. And I want to hear from uh, Ari and then Chef Michael and then Doug. Um, so Bryce asks, weirdest beers you've tried and were you pleasantly surprised? So uh, Ari, we'll start with you. Was it worst beers I've tried? <laughs> no, we weirdest beers. <laughs> Weird? So I um, there used to be RIP, an amazing bottle shop here in Durham, and they brought mm -hmm. in some beers made with peated malt the same way scotch would be. Mm -hmm. And one of them was called, I want to say Fumagot, but it was a peated malt sour. Hmm. And I was very surprised. You know, it's one of those days I had a birthday. Mom always gives me a gift card to Quick Shop because she knows what makes my heart sing. And I went in there with, you know, I'm going to try this $15, 350 And I was so pleasantly surprised. It never occurred to me that the smokiness of scotch would even be nice soured. Mm -hmm. Never occurred to me in my mind. And, and it was truly fantastic. Um, just I'm one of those adventure seeker drinkers, and it was the most pleasant adventure I got on that year. Okay, and uh, Chef Michael, weirdest beer you ever tried, and did you like it? Um, well, I, I'm going to go back to that dill pickle sour, which I thought was uh, a pretty cool, pretty weird beer. And, and, mm -hmm. and Professor Miller and I were talking about the, the, the possibilities with that, pairing it with like a, a Reuben or a corned beef sandwich of some mm -hmm. kind. But um, uh, I think one of the, the, the best pairings I ever had that, was, that I thought was really interesting was um, mm -hmm. while we were there, um, there was Prison City Brewing and uh, mm -hmm. Chef Ch Tracy Rogers. And um, what they did was they had a hopped sour, uh, a fermented ale that they had. And uh, the chef paired with that a uh, uh, grilled pork belly. And then he did it with uh, um, um, this like uh, rice that he had togarashi all over and some nori flakes and things like that. And that rice pairing with that sour beer was just, it was an amazing pairing. It wasn't something I would have thought of, but the lightness of that sour and the, the acidity of the sour went really nicely with the, with the uh, rice on that dish and the fattiness of the pork. I thought that was a great pairing. Hmm. That sounds delicious. And Doug, weirdest beer. That's tough. <laughs> weirdest beer, because I like weird stuff. So to me, and this is why, this is why too, is, is what's weird to one individual might not be, because I'm definitely that adventurous crowd, so you really got to do something unusual to make me think it's weird. Uh, I would say when I judged... Uh, uh, it wasn't weird, but it's very, very interesting. So when I judged the New York State Brewers competition two years ago, uh, the winner 
three years ago, the winter brewed a beer utilizing maple water. So not maple sap, mm. but the maple water from the tree. Uh, mm. And it was absolutely delightful because it had a slight acidity note to it, it almost like a sassafras note to it. Um, and that's what they used instead of water is they use maple water or maple sap from the tree. Hmm. And uh, I want to kind of switch up a little bit. Our, uh, Chef Michael, you had mentioned this a little bit before, but I want to ask Ari. Um, Ari, people frequently have a cultural connection, you know, between grilling meat, having barbecues and drinking beer and stuff like that. Um, based on, you know, the type of barbecue in the South, um, how do you think that could go into intentionally um, pairing a beer? You know, so the different kinds of barbecue flavors, for example. So I don't know how much the team, the uh, audience knows, but North Carolina is pretty uh, fragmented around barbecue. <laughs> but there's a little line kind of like that in the state. And over here, they put mustard in it. And over here, we put vinegar in it. I'm from down east. I'm from Smithfield, North Carolina. I do vinegar. And it's got some good spice, some good heat. I mean, we grew up bringing our pig home alive and doing it all ourselves in a pit. So my way of thinking is a little bit of smoke because that Eastern style is so prevalently spice and spice and vinegar. So I mm -hmm. think a smoky beer there goes really well. Or again, flavor, fat, good IPA works well there for me. I prefer traditional American style IPA when I'm drinking, when I'm when I'm drinking and with barbecue, that's kind of the way I go. Now when mm -hmm. you go to that other side and decide you're gonna eat the mustard barbecue. For those, I tend to go a little bit lighter, a little bit more Pilsner, because again, it's not as acidic because they don't use as much vinegar in it. And so mm -hmm. that pairing for me works a little bit better if I go to the lager or crispier side. Mm -hmm. And you know, then there's Texas and they do that sweet barbecue sauce thing and just drink at that point. <laughs> I can see you feel a certain way about sweet, so no, about sweet barbecue. barbecue. It's, it's sauce me and it's fine, it's delicious. Just don't say it's barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know that's good to know and um, <laughs> chef michael how should we think about you know maybe not just barbecue but the different cuisines you know throughout the country so in you know the northeast for example we have a lot of seafood or you know in the south we have comfort food you know how should we you know kind of think about that along those lines i i agree wholeheartedly <laughs> with what um ari points out in in regards to the barbecue I, I you have those main flavors you have sweet you have sour and 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 uh sweet as as ari mentioned from like the the sticky sauces that you might have in kansas city style or in texas style or things like that um when you're doing your barbecue sauces that way the sour is an important component the smoke and the amount of smoke is going to matter so um you know typically in, in in when you're doing any kind of barbecue you usually don't want like a hard fast smoke that's going to give it a really kind of bitter acrid taste that's not going to make the barbecue very good um so uh usually it's like a, a slow uh gentle smoke that you want to get onto your meats um that's why when you're doing whole whole hog or half hog cookery um or you're doing you know big bone in uh boston butts that you're going to have so that you they, they take uh, six eight hours to cook or uh, a texas brisket that you just put salt and pepper on and smoke it slowly for 12 16 hours depending on the size right um you have fat in there and that as we um brought out before that goes really well with the ipas that'll go really well you know playing with the fat and the sours that'll work as well um some other things that you could keep in mind too are um not just smoking the meats but you know are you smoke roasting vegetables and things of that nature um you know so uh, one of the dishes that i do is i do this uh uh, it's kind of like a play on scordalia, which is a, uh, uh, a kind of a mashed potato dish that you have, a Greek mashed potato dish with lots of garlic in there. And what I'll do is I'll take cauliflower and do it in place of the potatoes, and I'll smoke roast the cauliflower, just slice it into big slices, oil it up really well, season it, and smoke roast it on the grill. And then I'll puree that with some toasted almonds and uh, um, a little bit of roasted garlic in there. And that has like a really mild flavor to it, right? And that'll play 
really nicely with a lot of these beer styles that we're talking about. And you get that background of smoke flavor that goes in there. And I think that pairs really well with a lot of uh, different beer styles. So, you know, playing with your barbecue and, and, and doing a lot of different grilling and things like that and, and playing with those different, um, you know, either trying to accentuate notes or, or pair different flavors or kind of play off of each other with the textures. Um, easy to do with when you're smoking foods and, and doing you're working with your grill. No, I'm trying to like write down the med, trying to like write down the recipe so I can cook for what's my house. Uh, Doug, how should we uh, you know think about you know pairing beers when we're thinking about different cuisines from different parts of the country? Yeah, so there's this uh, adage what grows together goes together. So if you mm-hmm. look at cuisines historically from certain parts of the world, uh, the beers go along with that. So if you look at uh, uh, German style food uh, mm-hmm. that go well with German style beers, uh, you know, uh, 200 years ago, we didn't decide what we're going to pair with. It was mm-hmm. what we made is what we ate and drank. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's one thing to look at. And also to play on the, the vegetable thing is, is yeah, beer goes great with vegetables. You know, there mm-hmm. are some wines that are troubled to go with their trouble going with asparagus. It's a challenging pairing, uh, mm-hmm. but that's where beer can slide in there perfectly and go with different types of vegetables. Uh, so, you know, depending on part of the country you are, you know, we're talking about barbecue that can be said about uh, other different types of cuisine, um, you know, see what, see what goes well with you, you know, have a dinner party, you know, if you go to your local bottle shop or brewery, you know, instead of getting a case, get two of this, three of that, two of this, and see what you like, you know, so you have six friends, great dinner party six glasses, you pour a little of each glass, and have a great discussion on why things work. And as I was saying earlier, if you don't like it, why? Figure out why did that work for you? Or if you like it, why did it work for you? Mm-hmm. And I actually just got a great question in uh, from Heidi. So Heidi wants to know, what are your thoughts about uh, new beer innovations? For example, there's a uh, Korean style beer that's, uh, I guess, based with rice or mixed with uh, kind of a rice style beer. Um, and it pairs well with Asian cuisine and spicy dishes. So she wants to know kind of what are your thoughts about some of the new beer innovations? And uh, Doug, I'll start with you. So beer is always, always in reinventing and inventing. And, and you're now starting to look at new yeast strains. Uh, mm-hmm. I worked, uh, there's some students at Cornell that extracted yeast from an ancient Egyptian vegetable uh, vessel and then brewed a oh. beer with it uh, just to see what would turn out. Uh, mm-hmm. You're starting to see innovation on um, uh, lager styles, um, as lager mm-hmm. style seems to be the hot thing right now, and diversification mm-hmm. of, of lager style beers and different sub nuances. I mean, currently right now there is over, uh, with the Craft Brewers Association, there's over 120 different beer styles recognized. Uh, which sounds like a lot for a general individual. Don't get too deep in the weeds on the different variances and variations of these beer styles. Mm -hmm. Still think on a broad scale, but that's where the beer world is going is is like beer is art, right? Mm -hmm. How can that brewer put their spin on something or put their mark on something that might be uniquely slightly different than somebody else? Mm -hmm. And Ari, I want to get your thoughts on uh, kind of the innovation aspect. I know we had talked a little bit before we got started about how you love creating things. Uh, So I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of some of the new beer innovations. Um, What I'm really enjoying is seeing um, more voices in American craft beer in particular. Um, We're seeing a lot of work being done as far as inclusivity and just bringing in people who haven't traditionally brewed in these craft brews with their different ideas and different palettes and different like regions that they're from and bringing in those ideas. So I'm enjoying seeing that because my palette is all over the place, except for a few things we talked about beforehand. (laughs) So I love the idea of innovation, like anything that doesn't evolve eventually Mm -hmm. will die, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked heavily here around climate change you know, part of the mission of our company is to increase Southern agriculture by intentionally making purchases at Southern farms. You know, we have, mm-hmm. we're brewing our first batch of beer with our own particular Pilsner malt. That's our own malt blend with local maltsters. Mm-hmm. So we are going to have to innovate, right? Mm-hmm. If barley stops being as easily grown in our area, what's that mean for us? Does it mean we use more rice? Does does the adjunct lager come back? Does I mean, think about the rice beers of the of the war seasons where people started using rice because they needed the barley to feed mm. the troops. 
So, mm. you know, these innovations are just another way of the human palate evolving and the human experience evolving. So mm. I'm all for it. I'm an adventurer. I'm getting into Gruits, um, which are hopless beers, which are mm. actually really old style, but they're starting to kind of come around now as basically hops got really expensive and hard to get there for a while. Mm. And we do have to kind of think about how is climate change and other market conditions, including this, the supply chain, affecting our ability and what we decide to make because we are running the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chef Michael, uh, your response as well on kind of some of the new beer innovations and things to think about. I think it's fantastic. And the things that, uh, you know, Ari points out in regards to having different voices coming to the table and, and showing us different beer styles. It's interesting to see globally what's happening with beer. You know, Vietnam has a, a beer culture that's just on fire right now. And if you take a look at their history, you know, they... Um, you know, they stopped making rice wine because uh, they needed rice to feed the troops during during their their war. Right. So, um, you know, they, they have a really strong beer culture, the beer that they have. And, and you see a lot of people that are brewing over there. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's a lot of uh, uh, people from New Zealand and, and places like that that are brewing beer. And I'm not I, I'm not saying that's unfortunate. But what you see is you see more uh, local Vietnamese that are, are being brought to the table and kind of bringing the flavors and tastes of that country. So they'll use things like cashews and vanilla mm -hmm. and uh, cacao and things like that are grown in the country. Black pepper, all that stuff is being introduced into the beers. And, and you know, from a chef standpoint, um, you know, that's fantastic because then we play with those flavors. And if I know those ingredients are in, are in a beer, I'm going to play with those ingredients and, and kind of pair those ingredients with the beer, um, you know, depending on the barley or the, uh, the things that you have in there, if you're working with that barley product, I might do something like make a, a barley risotto, a barley style risotto that I use the risotto method to, to make the barley and kind of showcase the beer that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Ari brings up another fantastic point, um, other than bringing other voices to the table, is the sustainability aspect. I think that's going to be really important going forward. We're going to see a lot of that. Um, you know, you see companies like, uh, you know, lar larger companies like uh, uh, Sierra Nevada or um, uh, Lagunitas who are opening breweries in different states so that they could have easier distribution and stuff like that. I don't know that that's necessarily the answer that we want more of that macro. I like the idea of having more micro breweries and having more of those voices coming together and kind of representing each community and the communities are in. But uh, with the different beer styles, I say bring it. It seems like you were touching on uh, that kind of all the different craft beers and microbreweries kind of take on the flavor of, you know, where they're from. Is that kind of getting at the point there? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I mean, you know, the, 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 the ingredients that are in one area or versus another area, you know, I was, I'm, un, I'm on the West coast, so I'm unfamiliar with the, uh, the, the beers from, from Ari's brewery, but in, in perusing her website, seeing that they're using things like pow pow and beer, which is a local ingredient that they're putting in there. I mean, I'm, we're not going to have that on the West coast and we shouldn't have that on the West coast because we don't grow that out here and it's not one of our ingredients, but you know, for, for, uh, highlighting the beer in her, community that's a fantastic ingredient to be working with and all right what's your favorite uh thing to mix in with the beer so like the pow pow for example like chef michael had mentioned what's your favorite thing that's specific uh, to the to, to the tar heel state specific to the tar heel state i do think it is paw paw it is one of our mm -hmm. just southern fruits um it's native mm -hmm. to north carolina i'm mm -hmm. also um a really big fan, which is not unique to North Carolina, but basil. If you mm. put basil in pretty much any beer, I'm coming to drink it. I love basil. <laughs> I love the lightness of it. I like how it pairs with pretty much everything that I eat. So basil is probably my favorite overall ing ingredient. And my North Carolina ingredient definitely is the pawpaw. I've come to really enjoy them. I'll even like eat them raw now, which was not the case when mm. I first got to this company. Mm -hmm. And I really want to quickly just, you know, kind of touch on the folks who are going to be hosting, you know, Thanksgiving or hosting some holiday meals coming up. Um, is there a beer that you would recommend or a style of beer that you would recommend that's um, very general, that even if somebody's, you know, not a super heavy beer drinker, but, you know, drinks beer occasionally, um, that you would recommend somebody get for maybe their, you know, audience who they're hosting at their home? Um, Doug, I'd like to 
get your thoughts on that. Well, I was going to say, why do one? Because, you know, <laughs> if you're having uh, a gathering, again, grab two of this, three of that. Instead of buying a six-pack, grab a couple. Or mm. maybe grab a couple growlers or, or crawlers, smaller packaging. Uh, mm. I love brown ales for Thanksgiving because uh, mm. it goes great with the turkey. Uh, maybe light lagers. If there's somebody who's like not really into beer, they might light su- like something that's a little bit lighter, such as a light lager. Uh, or, you know, me, cranberry relish and a sour beer, I'm good. Mm-hmm. And uh, how about you, Chef Michael? Um, well, if I had to do one, and uh, a- again, from perusing Ari's site, I haven't tasted this beer, but I'm going with the full steam carver, which is supposed to be a sweet potato beer that would be going with all the sweet potato items that I have on my, my uh table. So, um, you know, I, I think it's interesting because for my family, traditionally, uh, and my in-laws, they turned us on to the Beaujolais Nouveau. And it's kind of when we think about Thanksgiving, you know, that's a, a French wine that that breaks the rules because we got a white meat, the turkey, and we're pairing a red wine with that. But it's like fruity and light, and it actually works well with all the ingredients that we have on there. And that's something we do. And I'm kind of wondering if Ari might know what the, what the uh, equivalent of that Beaujolais Nouveau would be in beer for for our seasonal item that we would be having at this time of year that you would be making. Like I think once once somebody's able to brew that and make it a national product, they're going to make it big. Well, I have a brewery in mind, but uh, that uh, puts a lot of really interesting farmy beers out that pairs so well with food. But you know, my table this year will definitely be Carver, and for my folk and my family who are more comfort palettes i tend to bring home just a wit beer just a simple wit beer is sweet mm-hmm. enough it's not too beery it's not too heavy and so like my 65 year old aunt will like have a glass with me <laughs> i love that and um i just have a couple more questions before we wrap up um, i wanted to make sure i asked uh, this question from elias who actually graduated in the class of 72 so elias asks other than savor every year in dc um, are there other beer food pairing events uh that viewers might want to experience or is there one that you might suggest um doug maybe we'll hear from you first so um savor is a fabulous event in washington dc uh every year uh, Great American Beer Festival, where Chef and I uh, did an event uh, that's mm-hmm. typically the first or second week of October in mm-hmm. Denver, where they do huge beer and food pairing part off offside of the main floor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would also check with the local Brewers Guilds uh, to see if they have any type of events that they're doing, because there's Brewers Guilds in every state, and oftentimes mm-hmm. they put on different types of festivals and beer events and food events also. Mm-hmm. And uh, Chef Michael, is there one event that you would recommend um, for folks um, looking to kind of pair? I, I don't have an event that I would recommend, but um, I would recommend that you, uh, as, as Doug pointed out, check out your Brewers Guild. Uh, I would check out your local breweries, because they often um, work with a lot of restaurants. One of the things that's kind of interesting is a lot of culinary schools, you know, because we're training students to pair food with wine and food with beer, and we're, we're, we're training their palates and things like that, um, definitely uh, look to see if they have restaurants that are open to the public, because oftentimes you'll find a lot of good pairing uh, events there, because the, and, and, and a lot of those schools can use your, your money and uh, uh, to help to uh, uh, build their programs and educate the students. It's great and a lot of them are done for a great cause. So that's what I would recommend checking out. And uh, Ari, is there any event you would recommend checking out? Um, Being from Durham, I really love the Bull City (laughs) experience. It takes around 40 local restaurants and pairs each of them with a local brewery. Mm. So the chef and the brewery come together, look at the beer list. You know, some are intentional enough to brew a beer just for the event. Mm-hmm. And those pairings are phenomenal, great local music. Um, it is very much a Durham thing, but I'd love mm-hmm. to have some visitors to come check it out. <laughs> For sure. Anybody who's in the Tar Heel State, you got to check that out. Um, so we have about two minutes left, um, and I thought I wanted, could get some kind of last thoughts from everybody, um, maybe to leave our audience with one nugget or one thing to remember. Um, Chef Michael, you had mentioned before uh, fat and flavor, but... We'll scratch that. We'll give somebody. We'll give. We'll give everybody else another one. Um, Jeff Michael, we'll start with you. 
Uh, I, I would say one more that I would keep in mind is, is when you're pairing your food and your beer, uh, taste both the food and the beer intermittently so that you can see what's going on with them. Typically, you're going to have three outcomes. One is going to be the food overpowers the beer. The other one would be the beer overpowers the food. And then the last one, which is the desired one, is that the two products go so well together that they create more than the sum of their parts. Okay. And uh, how about you, Ari? I would say trust yourself. You know, you're an individual. You know, we can sit here and tell you what to do and what you should or shouldn't like. But if you like it, you like it. And it's okay if it's a high life. It's okay if it's Saison DuPont. It's okay if it's Cantillon. You know, the whole point of beer is the way I see it, community coming together, opening a glass and cheers in your friends and loved ones. So if you like it, don't be ashamed. Go out there, fly your flag about it. Enjoy the beer you enjoy, but also it's okay to just have a beer. You don't have to get the fancy glass of wine. <laughs> That's good to know. And Doug, final thoughts. Final thoughts is just enjoy. You know, don't get caught up in trying to make the perfect pairing and, and this beer I must have to go with this dish. Just enjoy. Uh, enjoy the company, enjoy who you're with, enjoy the food, enjoy the beer. Um, are there opportunities to get geeky on it? Absolutely, but don't overthink it. <laughs> Don't overthink it. That's a perfect note. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, audience, I want to thank you so much for your participation. If for whatever reason you missed any part of this, of course, is being recorded. So you can always go back and rewatch it at the uh, same link that you're watching now. Doug, Ari, Chef Michael, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. And audience, thank you so much for joining us today. And have a good day and have a good uh, weekend. And we'll talk to you later. Thank you so much. Thanks, y'all.